Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPB to advance excellent teaching. Good morning. Uh, my name is Joyce Rudowski. I'm very glad to see you all here this morning on a, a wonderful Saturday in February in Cincinnati, a little dreary, but we'll cheer things up. Uh, it's a very special event for all of us here at Country Day to be able to invite our friends and community to come and see what we're doing, to see what our students are doing. The Computerized Education Conference was organized by a group of students during the first semester. If all of you who are teachers and administrators and have been working all this week as, as in a classroom or so forth, if you would raise your hands and keep them up, please. We want to see who our teachers are. Oh, that's great. Lots of people who have worked hard all week with students. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Now, I'd like to ask our student presenters, if you would all stand and stay standing, please. What's going on here? The teachers and administrators have become the students. The students are now the teachers. Has the educational revolution taken place? Stay tuned. I'm John Merrow. Welcome to Learning Matters. The production and broadcast of Learning Matters have been made possible by the Lilly Endowment, Incorporated, of Indianapolis, Indiana. Cincinnati Country Day School is an unlikely place to find an educational revolution. It's an elite private school with 740 students, pre-kindergarten through 12th grade, situated on 62 acres in the elegant neighborhood of Indian Hill, just outside Cincinnati, Ohio. But technology, chiefly 100 computers, two pioneering teachers, Joe Hoffmeister and Joyce Rodowski, and a philosophy that makes students take responsibility for their own learning have made Cincinnati Country Day something of a mecca for teachers and administrators eager to learn about computers. On this particular Friday, students are rehearsing for Saturday's role reversal when they will be teachers for the day. Ha! Ah, there it is. <laughs> Thank you. Sophomore Kirsten Hardig will be teaching the adults computer art using a picture of herself that she took with a camcorder and then fed directly into the computer. It came up in black and white and I cut myself out actually out of the background and colored it in. You don't mean with scissors? No, I mean but with the computer you can cut things out, cut, and then you can paste it into a different program even. That's so what that I background did. is not where you were? No. <laughs> no, you I... You were not in an, in an aquarium tank? No. <laughs> I, um... I drew, I drew the background, but I also scanned the fish in, and then I copied them and put them in there. You lost it already. Them. You scanned? Used a scanner. It's just like a when you copy papers off, it's just like that, but it copies into the computer. Okay. Suppose you put a color up there and you don't like it. If you then, were doing a painting, you would be stuck. No, you can erase the color. On you the can computer, put a different color in. You can test it. Mm -hmm. See what you'd look like with orange have, eyes. I, it's d a lot different than painting on a piece of paper where once you paint something, you're stuck with it. On the computer, you can undo it or you can just paint over it and there will be, you can't see the color underneath. Could you change the color of those fish? Mm hmm I mean, would you like me to do it? Absolutely. Okay. I'd like those just, fish to be, you decide. How about... Mm. Green. Oh. Red. That. Red. Let's have red fish. Yeah. Kirsten believes that the computer has made her a better, more imaginative artist. A lot of hand and eye coordination go into it. And when I first started drawing on the computers, I could not draw anything. And it teaches you a lot quicker and easier hand, coordination, hand and eye coordination than on a piece of paper. I don't get it. Well, on a piece of paper, piece of paper, you have to try and try again. But on the computer, you can erase it and try it a number of times right on the computer to get it right. Jason Herman is a junior at Cincinnati Country Day School. He and another student used a program called HyperCard to produce their report on chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs, and the ozone layer. 
HyperCard allows the reader to jump to any point in the report. So you just click on index mm -hmm. and it takes you to the point of direction mm -hmm. and you go from there on whatever information you desire. Like if you're not sure what CFCs and the ozone is, you would click here. You have the overview which would give you more choices such as you know, a story on a, a gentleman who believes he's predicted this and his ways of uh, preventing and causes of the ozone problem. Uh, you have the prevention methods. You can go a teacher grading this, reading, or anyone who wants to see it can choose what they want to learn at the uh -huh. same time. Can, can you, uh, could you add information? Suppose you just learned something new about... Well, uh, if I wanted to add something, it's, it's really easy to just put stuff in. You simply would just create a new card and then to enter your new information. Mm -hmm. And it would save it inside the computer. And the next time you want to access mm -hmm. it, it would just be as easy as just clicking on the buttons. Yeah, keep, people keep saying buttons. What are buttons? Well, buttons allow you to... Uh, they're a navigation tool. They let you move between each card. Mm -hmm. um, they're your source. Without buttons, you couldn't go from one card to the, mm -hmm. to the next, basically. And well, what is that up there now? This is a chart of uh, CFCs and the ozone depletion. We did this. We took our own data and created our own chart. Mm -hmm. We made this chart ourselves and graphed it and then imported it in a hypercard. Mm -hmm so that you get an idea and if you want if a person wants to see what the 12.12 percent .12 would be you would just click and it would tell you are you uh, going to be teaching some of this to the adults tomorrow well the the people the visitors who come will most likely they'll get a good education of hypercard and if they don't already know about the ozone layer it should help them learn a little bit more how do you find adults as learners do they learn as quickly as uh, kids well it seems the older generation that they're always worried that they're afraid of computers, afraid they won't understand how to use them. And they come in with a pre, a preset in their head that they're not going to understand. And they're, you have to take it slow and show them that it's really easy. There's nothing to be afraid of. Cincinnati Country Day offers a course in HyperCard for 6th and 7th graders, but many students pick it up on their own. In fact, most students here become comfortable with computers in elementary school, as these three 7th graders, Heather Roth, Gabriella Duty, and Tammy Brown, did. Librarian Anna Hartle, who's working with them on their project on African exploration, says their enthusiasm for the technology makes learning easier. They're, I don't know if you heard them earlier, they, they were... So it's my turn to do a button. It's my turn to do this. They, they all want to do it, and I think it's great. It's, it's kind of a, <laughs> a motivational projects. That well, let me, let, me, let me argue about this. I mean, so they're learning the technology, but are you learning any stuff, any things mm -hmm. about Africa? I've never heard of Mungo Park, and now I know he's a Scottish explorer who did two expeditions in northern Africa. And died on a second trip. Um, Local Drowned people. Drowned yeah. by local times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're so, studying Africa right now in their, in their cultural studies class. So this doesn't get in the way of learning real information about Africa or whatever? No. Is that a silly question? <laughs> well, I mean, if you have so much fun with the technology, I could hear people saying, well, wait a minute, that's too much fun. They're not going to learn. I think fun makes things easier to learn. Explain what you mean. Well, if I'll be interested in it. If I'm not interested, I'll just be like, I don't want to. I don't want to learn it. It's stupid. But this is fun and it's interesting. Do you agree, Gabe? Yes, I do agree. Because, oh, <laughs> like, it's more fun. Like, if a teacher t I taught all this to you, it'd be a lot more boring. And it's more fun to learn it on a computer. Well, it does make learning more fun, but in some cases, I don't think some teachers are ready for this. <laughs> what do you mean? Like, some of them are back in the dark ages <laughs> teaching, like, well, this means this, and, you know, and make notes and everything like that, and it's boring. Well, They're then why don't really you ready for this. convert them? Well, it's kind of weird because some people, they don't know a lot about computers, and it's hard to teach some people about it because they're so one-sided. I've heard it said so, that it's not that they don't want to, it's that they're sort of afraid. Well, the computer, if you make a mistake, you cannot usually correct it. So it's not really smart to be afraid. Only about half of the teachers here use computers in their teaching. It's not required. And some students are still wary. 
In this rehearsal, two students presented their report on romantic themes in early American literature and painting. One student objected. Too much flashy technology, he said, detracting from the substance. What bothered him in particular were these bugs crawling around the page. What I'm saying is that you, you're your own worst enemy. You killed your own project by the fact that... Uh, project's dead. <laughs> it's a sarcastic comment. What happened was that you kind of were your own worst enemy because, as I said, your thing could be just as good as any, or better than anybody else's here, but because you put so much attention into the graphics, it just, you know, it was a distraction, and so, you know, there's not as much attention. But isn't it also on our project? We, uh, we didn't, like, blow those off and just do the background. We did, uh, we worked hard on the passage, and then we added the uh, background to, like, help, when you read it, it helps you visualize it. But I think there's a point where it gets too junk, and I think there's a point where it gets a little too gaudy, and, and there's a limit to it, where it doesn't, instead of helping it out, it distracts, and it, it you know, and it takes away from it. I do think, you know, as I said, it's supportive, but as I said, there's a limit, and there, you know, there's a fine line, and when you go to the fine line, instead of being helpful, it really kind of kills So we go over the fine line here? Well, I really didn't see much of the theme, but from what I can see, I think they kind of did, yes. They didn't just put, you know, pictures of things for no reason. Everything meant something that went along with their project, right. what they were saying. Cincinnati Country Day School has a total of 100 computers, 70 Macintoshes, and 30 older Apple IIe's. There are three main computer rooms, plus four mini-computer rooms, each with four or five computers. Seven years ago, the school had just one computer, according to Joe Hoffmeister. Since then, the school has invested $200,000 in computers and related equipment. Hoffmeister, who's been teaching here since 1970, and his co-worker Joyce Radowski are the acknowledged leaders of the educational revolution here, which they say is now as much philosophical as technological. We started out actually with uh, technology and it kind of led us to something bigger. And so when people come here, we frequently tell them that, you know, what we want you to go away with is not an idea about hardware, but an idea about education. And we kind of stumbled into that ourselves three years ago when we realized that uh, these new gizmos uh, and gadgets were changing classrooms around from places where kids were just sitting there like bumps, taking notes and spitting back the stuff, the classical model of education, to places where kids were building things and simulating things, and that was really exciting for us. What we're building on is the probably the oldest principle of education, which is when you do it, you learn it. When you have to do something, if I have to drive to the airport, I learn how to get to the airport. If you drive me to the airport, then you've learned how to get to the airport, and I haven't, because the next time that I have to go, I probably need a map. Um, so the, that old principle of when you have to teach something, you learn it. And we as teachers know that. We know we learn our subject better when we have to teach somebody else. We're putting the kid in the same situation and saying, teach the computer about this subject, whether it's quadratics or American history or Civil War or whatever. Now, if you think about the, the fact that uh, education isn't just transferring information, you know, the kid is over there and you've got a bunch of stuff to tell him. If that's all there is to it, then you know the old style of the kid sitting there being quiet and following direction works fine but if education means something else than just taking in information and it ought to from the word education itself to draw out of rather than pour into um, then this other thing works fine it's just that there never have been the proper tools to do it we've never had enough tools for kids to do stuff and so teachers end up doing all the work what's your philosophy about mistakes <laughs> That's how you learn. Yeah. Our Wilson history has a good teacher, one. yeah. yeah Our history Wilson. teacher who is not mm -hmm. a techie, she's not real comfortable with technology, she's real comfortable with history. Um, she has said that she'll watch kids as they're creating projects, using the computer, interacting, and she said she'll watch them go down the wrong path, and she knows they're going in a dead end. And when they finally get to the end of the path and turn to her and say, Oh, Dr. Fogelson, we've made a terrible mistake. This is just awful. We've gone the wrong way, and now we know we should have done something else. She says, that's an A. When you learn from your mistake and can really live your mistake, not just a red mark on the paper, but really deal with the information, analyzing, gathering, and, uh, and drawing conclusions from it that you know that you were wrong, that's when you've got an A. We don't let kids make enough mistakes because we're so interested in them having 
getting them the right answer. Well, most teachers believe that, that if, if kids are doing stuff, then they're going to learn it better. And teachers want kids to learn it better. So the problem is, how do you get kids involved with what you do? And the standard answer, and it's not easy, but it's the simplest one that's been available, is the teacher jazzes up the presentation, tries to compete with Mr. Rogers and Sesame Street and all the rest of that stuff that's on TV. And they can't do that day in and day out. But if you can put the, uh, uh, something in the hands of the students where they're going to be able to do something with it, then you are in business. And that's what we found with the, the computers and the multimedia tools fit into this big gap. Give the kids a chance to use this stuff and build things. And even though you don't know exactly where it will end up, they will build marvelous things. And furthermore, they'll give you back what you want most if you're a good teacher. And that is they get excited about what you want them to be excited about. Imperialism in Africa in the last century or something like that, which they're not going to be excited about from you just telling them about it. It builds on the model of students being actively involved in creating their own knowledge. We can, when we present, even the, the most glitzy presentation, we are giving them facts, but we're not giving them ideas. They have to create those themselves. And so by putting this, the student in a situation where they can no longer be the passive recipient of just the facts, but have to be involved. And for some students, that's a risk. It's not just, uh, just easy going, but, um, because they're used to being passive, and especially here. Our kids are real good at getting A's. They know the system. It's you tell me, I tell you back, and you give me an A, and then I go to Harvard. Mm -hmm. And that's awfully nice, but we haven't really created the kind of citizen and well-rounded person and thoroughly educated student that we want. Okay. Uh, devil's advocate. Sure, then you'll have the kids discover this, but if I teach it the tr traditional way, I can get through Algebra 1. If you do it your way in discovery, the kids might only get through a month. Isn't yeah. that wonderful? You will have covered the subject. <laughs> yeah. The difference right. is people, people, teachers think, you know, that when they do a great class and they cover all this material, that, but they forget. That doesn't mean that the students learn it. They might memorize it and give it back to you, but they'll tell you very quickly that... Uh, that it doesn't stick. But what if the kids mm -hmm. only learn one month's worth in mm -hmm. a year? Or are you a, saying that doesn't happen? Well, we're saying no. that one month is better than no month. Well, and, and actually we do have some evidence, especially from a, an earth science class yeah. here, where uh, a year ago the teacher, the same teacher with about the same level students, changed the course around completely by, inter by integrating technology. She was using spreadsheets and hypercard and video disk and all kinds of long-term projects and so forth. And she found that by Christmas, so mid mid-year or the end of the first semester, she had done more, covered more material from her point of view, and in greater depth. What she found was, as she stood back and analyzed it, in the past where she had presented the topic of density of, of objects, uh, it had taken her twice as long to present it because the kids didn't get it the first time so she had to do it again and then when she asked them questions the next day she had to answer those questions again because they still hadn't gotten it so it was repetition of presentation when she turned the kids loose with you're going to do this experiment this workshop or, or project yourself you're going to analyze the data using a spreadsheet and then you're going to write a report for me they got it the first time and then uh, they asked her more questions about it. So they wanted more information because they already understood that the surface stuff that she would have covered in the past. Furthermore, you know, think about it for yourself. What, when do you learn best? Look back at your schooling. And I, when I look back at mine, it's not the, it's not the times when I've been in the, the, the singular occurrences. You know, 40 years ago, I'm in high school and I'm thinking, you know, which teachers do I remember? The teachers I remember are the ones that got me to do something, not the ones that were spectacular kind of performers. Teachers and administrators began arriving early on Saturday morning. Most were from Ohio and neighboring Indiana, but a few came from Minnesota, and one woman flew in from California. In all, nearly 200 adults came to be taught by the students. Basically, the stack uh, dealt with the ozone layer problem. I um, started
start by first playing around with some scanned images and then coloring them in. And I've done about three because they take me a long time because I never have time to do them. This is one of my, this was the second one I did for a class this, the beginning of this year. Now what do you do with it at that point? It's sort of fun because it's, it's your own video and that's something that you've made. And so watching it is really, is fun because, you know, you, it's something that you've accomplished and made and it just makes you, and it pumps up your confidence. Our first step was to research information on Africa in the on the Grolier Electronic Encyclopedia on, on the CD-ROM. We'll now demonstrate the encyc electric encyclopedia. Okay, I'm going to open Grawlers. This is a new version of Grawlers with pictures and maps. Now this is a search and I can look for a word or whatever I'm going to look for. What she's going to do is type in Africa. And what we were supposed to look up was one aspect of historical Africa. So what she's going to do is type in Africa for the title, and for the subtitle, it's going to be History of. And they'll show us all the articles that they have on that. Well, for all of them, for the information that they all will know. And then she's typing in Stanley. Remember that classroom discussion about graphics, too many bugs? Well, that caught the adults' eyes, too mountains in the background and they're like sticking out at you and you have the woods around it and it's almost as if the mountains are the focus and you it's like a far off object which you're looking at before you go on here could you tell us what's going on across the top of the page there? oh the bug um, okay what the thing is in the story is it's about this old this old tape in the uh, descriptions of it we basically said that uh, because of the description of it, there's so many allusions, stuff like making flowers like mad, like gems and stuff like that. It more or less challenges like your mind to think and create the scenario, the story. And so it went. Fourteen different presentations from nine in the morning to three that afternoon. Some of the questions were mundane. How long does it take to hook up the equipment? How much does that cost? And often, many adults in the audience directed their questions to the teacher who was accompanying the kids, not to the kids themselves. But then, it's tough to change roles just like that. So what happened here today when the roles were reversed, when teachers became students and students became teachers? Well, it takes more than a day to make a revolution, but some eyes were opened and some minds were changed. And not just here, maybe out there in your house. For Learning Matters, I'm John Marrow. Thanks for being with us. See you next time. To find out more about this program, visit us at PBS Online at the Internet address on your screen. The production and broadcast of Learning Matters have been made possible by the Lilly Endowment, Incorporated of Indianapolis, Indiana. We are indebted to Computer Video of 215 Salem Street in Woburn, Massachusetts for their assistance with this production. Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPB to advance excellent teaching. For information about this and other Annenberg CPB programs, call 1-800-LEARNER 
and visit us at www.learner.org.